likes to talk. Um, it has to be kept in order now and again. Uh, and to do this, we're going to have someone else's voice as well today. He's going to talk to us on the mediumship of Leslie Flint, the voice medium who I'm sure most of you have heard of. It's a very interesting talk, as are most of them, and each time that I've been, I've been to every seminar and most of the lectures, and although I've heard them all over and over again, there's something different every time, and we can all learn by this, and as you know, George has been in the movement a very long time, and he is still learning, as we all are, uh, learning by teaching, and teaching through his learning. So can we all give George a, a very warm welcome as we listen to his talk on the mediumship, the voices of Leslie Flynn. George Flynn. Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. When I walked in here this morning, only God and I knew what I was going to say. Now God only knows. <laughs> but we'll soon find out what God's got in store for you. I call this the Diary Voice Mediumship of Leslie Flint, who had his 82nd birthday uh, a few days ago, and whom I recently had the pleasure of going down to interview having not seen him for quite a number of years. I was pleased to see that he is still in full possession of all his faculties, and the same old Leslie that I've known for the last 20 years or so. <laughs> it was 1971, I mean. What I want to play to you today is a <coughs> variety of voices, just a few, to, to illustrate to you the different types of voices that came through. That is, for example, a foreign voice, a female voice, a male voice, the voice of his guide, and a child's voice. To pick, I picked out what I think will illustrate the range of voices, and of course there are loads more. We could go on for hours and hours. I just picked out short extracts. None of them will be more, at the most, uh, five minutes, usually three minutes, possibly five minutes, so that you won't get too bored. But hopefully it will encourage you when you to reach a certain standard. If you have uh, are, or are developing direct voice mediumship, direct voice mediumship, that this is the sort of standard to aim at. And Leslie's been a medium for 60 years, and in our newsletter uh, each month you'll, you'll find, as I manage to transcribe the tapes I've got, which takes me uh, quite a long time because I need sort of tap it into the word process. <laughs> I've got the tape earphones and I have to stop every few seconds, you see, not being a proficient typist. I'm typing that. If you have to read his views on, on mediumship and on spiritualism and the media today, how he, be, well, we've really covered how he began, and so on. And I first had the privilege of sitting with Leslie in 1971. Uh, he is not a trumpet medium, not anymore. He is what we call the independent direct voice, in which um, a voice box is built, which is roughly in that area, and can move around. <coughs> connected, if, uh, I had a photograph, and I couldn't find it to show you, where, which was taken with an infrared camera, where you can see that the ectoplasmic rod <coughs> coming from this part of his neck, I believe it's linked to the endocrine glands, it's where it seems to be how mediumship functions. Uh, and over here, like a fluctuating white mass which they describe as the voice box. A similar photographs were taken with Amona van der Watt, the lady who brought me into spiritualism through her voice mediumship, which was so spectacular, and um, various other mediums. So we know that there is this voice box. Now it is an artificial larynx, this you must understand. You're never going to get 100% uh, perfect communication, simply because those who communicate no longer have the earthly voice box which they had. They have to remember how they used to speak. 
and it says their thoughts, and as they touch the earth, their voice comes back. It will always be, and it must be, uh, an overlay of the medium somewhere there, or the medium's guide. Mickey, his uh, little talking guide, who was about 12 years old when he passed to the world of spirit, said that if communicators had difficulty, he would overshadow them. So that you will often hear, for example, uh, an overshadowing of Mickey's voice on top of the communicators to strengthen it. And very often, the medium's own voice on top of Mickey's overlaying that. <laughs> Somewhere or other, it is personality that's conveyed, not so much the exact replica of the voice. And when we pass to the world of spirit, I trust it will be our personalities that we will try to convey to those that are left behind, should we choose to return. I have made up my mind that perhaps I wouldn't return after all, and that will fox a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> How has it George has ever come back? <laughs> How make them think? I was discussing with my good friend Don Mercer the other night. I said, because he's going to go before me, you see. I mean, <laughs> It's going to go long before me, and um, I can be now. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I never make a prediction here, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what birth will precede me to the world of spirit? There, have you arranged that, George? <laughs> I've got inside information. <laughs> anyway, I said to him, "Have you thought of how you could perhaps uh, offer evidence of your survival to me?" And we sat and debated this the other night in the small hours. We haven't come to any conclusions yet. <laughs> Because Donald, as you know from his lecture, would have to follow the maxims that he's laid down, which he's used throughout his life. This is difficult. You sit down and you think, how am I going to convey to those I left behind that it is me communicating? It isn't easy. Because if you say, well, I shall say such and such a word or say something, immediately that's in your mind and some skeptic will say, oh, well, they picked that up anyway from your mind. So... Try to think about how you would convey your survival. It's not easy. However, what I believe is that when you can communicate with the world of spirit, and I don't mean just throwing up scraps of information, but have a dialogue, you're more likely to get the personality of the person conveyed to you uh, in that way. Because they come back with the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, the things they say, the knowledge they have, and things happening with you, uh, and I have spoken to my grandfather, my grandmother, and various people in the world of spirit on a person-to-person -person basis. And what is so interesting is that when this happens, you become so used to it, you can almost become blasé. And it is not until the day comes when suddenly it stops and it's no longer there, A, because the medium's not there anymore, <coughs> that you realise how precious this gift of communication is and how you miss it when it's not there. The first voice that I'm going to um, play to you is not a discarnate voice, except that he's discarnate now, but when I recorded it, he was on Earth, and that is the voice of Morris Barbonell, uh, who was asked a question as to what he thought, well, you'll hear the question, asked by a man who was making a tape for sale, and um, you'll hear what Barbara will say that he regards direct voice mediumship as probably one of the most evidential. So, all being well, if I press this button, you should hear the, de the voice of Dennis asking him this question. And which psychic phenomena have impressed you most during the many years you have been investigating and reporting on spiritualism? Unhesitatingly, what? are known as direct voice seances, which were held by probably the most versatile medium that we have ever known, namely Estelle Roberts. And once every fortnight we met in her seance room, and we always heard at least a dozen spirit communicators giving perfect evidence of their identity, which in my view completely proved individual survival after death. And Morris Barbadell, as many of you know, was the medium for Silver Birch, of whom there are many books uh, in Britain of his teachings, and which I quoted from on Sunday night. Silver Birch, when he spoke, had a very deep, guttural voice, totally different to uh, the medium. 
and I was very privileged to be invited to Henry Swatter's home circle um, many years ago. Uh, just to digress from where to tell you about that, because it, it is quite interesting. You could only get into the circle at the invitation of Silver Birch. It took me a long time to get to the invitations. I said, bombard him with thoughts from this world. <laughs> Until he got close to that, I expect that I received a letter inviting me to the circle. It was held at Barbanel's flat in St. John's Wood. And one thing that uh, Silver Birch always did was keep his promise. If he invited you to come back, which he didn't always do, then he would always keep that promise. And uh, I asked so many questions that evening, it filled up two editions of Two Worlds. <laughs> As you can imagine, it was quite a debate, uh, Silver Birch and I. And um, at the end he said, it's been very interesting, he said, you must come back again. I said, I should be delighted. Um, you invite me and I shall come. And he said, yes, I will. Well, some months went by and uh, I received a letter uh, from Barbanel to sign Barbie. It said, uh, Silver Birch, a sitting with Silver Birch will be held on such and such a date um, and you've been invited. When I looked at the date, I realised to my shock, horror and disappointment that I was going to be, I was on a cruise in the Mediterranean at the time and would be in Lisbon on that particular day and there was no way that I could get back on that Friday to the seance. So I, I phoned Barbanel and told him that I would have to um, regretfully decline the invitation. I couldn't get back. He said, oh, don't worry about it, the other one. Tony Orson was also invited, who at that time wasn't the editor of Psychic News, obviously. He couldn't go. He turned it down because he had a previous commitment. What none of us knew was that, that was the last seance that was ever held and then Barbanel died soon afterwards. And, um, but Silver Birch kept his promise. He had said he would invite me again, and he did. Uh, Joe Benjamin was then invited uh, in our place, Tony and myself, and it always amuses me to read how Joe Benjamin says, of course I was invited to the last sales, and I thought, well, he would have been there if I had been <laughs> But never mind. That's just by the way. Um, he spoke about Estelle Roberts, whom unfortunately I never had the pleasure of seeing because she was too ill when I arrived in this country um, to give sittings. But although she was the most versatile medium of the century, having every known psychic gift from psychometry to materialisation, Leslie Flynn concentrated solely on direct voice mediumship <coughs> and sat in the dark for nearly 60 years spent a great deal of his day in the dark and most of the evening as well. Uh, it says much for his devotion and dedication that he gave this time up because the seances would often be held at 11 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that, which meant a good couple of hours or, or so out of each day. And you could go along but nothing was ever guaranteed. And I, when I first went there, the first seance I went to was a complete blank. Not a word, and there we sat for over an hour, not in total silence, but in total darkness. And I've always found over the years that if something isn't genuine, or a phenomenon is happening which isn't genuine, when I turn up, it all seems to go wrong and nothing happens. <laughs> seems to be that. So I went there and I thought, oh, yes, well, I wonder if he is as genuine as he's made out to be. And so I went the second time. And the second time, all we heard was, no power with old Flinty. No power with old Flinty, said this voice. It's a very faint whisper. I thought it was marvellous. Coming out of the dark, it's wonderful, I thought. Direct voice at last. And I, he said, you must come again. No charge was made if the seance was a blink. It is a lot for Leslie Flint as well. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, well, I'll give it one more go. Third time, if nothing happens, then I realised that it's me. I'm sort of uh, having this negative effect on, on it. Well, the third time we went, the lights were put out, and within seconds of the lights going out, the voices began. And the first person to speak to me was my grandmother, my father's mother, who was always been the first communicator to ever come through uh, and speak to me. Um, I don't remember a great deal about her, but my mother tells me that, or told me, that I was her favourite grandson. 
and that because she was so crippled with arthritis, I just used to stand between her legs, so because I couldn't sit on her lap. And what was I knew my mother's mother extremely well. She never communicated. It was my father's mother, whom I didn't remember, who communicated, which made the evidence that was given through me, given to me, most impressive, because I had to go and check it out with my parents. And Leslie Flint is the only medium through whom she's ever given her first name. No other medium has ever succeeded in transmitting it. And um, I'm not going to challenge you to do it today because I have passed that sort of stage. I don't care. Um, she said to me then that the day will come when I shall no longer come to you. Others will come. And following the passing of my father and mother to the other world, she came twice, brought my father, showed him how to do it, and I've never heard from her again. Isn't that interesting? Spirit world, you see, um, if they're reading your mind, if mediums are reading your mind, or reading your aura and telling all about you, we continue to give this. Not a single medium ever suggested to me, or implied that my grandmother was present, from the time that she said she was never coming back again. Where she's gone, heaven alone knows. Uh, she may have reincarnated all I know. <laughs> I don't think so. I think she's progressed and is going on in the other world. <coughs> um, prior to my mother and father passing to the other world, not a single medium that I ever sat with ever suggested or implied that my mother or father were present. And you know how some mediums, I've put Dunham here, of course, come up and say, uh, like one did to me once at, uh, at the church right here by the president, um, your father's in spirit. I said, well, isn't he or isn't he? <laughs> well, I had nothing of that. Um, so this, this alleged medium soon sat down and gave up, gave me up a bad job. So um, no one ever did. And that in itself is quite fascinating. However, back to Leslie Flint. The, um, as I say, my grandmother came and a guide came and most of the sounds was taken up with... Um, their communications. I found this extremely fascinating because I couldn't wait for the next appointment. And there are a couple here in the library today, in fact at this very moment, who have sat with me for, uh, in Leslie Circle on a regular basis every month for many years. We started in 1971. We both came to the college year in, in May 72, was it? Or was it September 72? May 72 at Flint's. September 72 we came to Stansted where we hoped to see materialisation and uh, with Gordon Higginson that was the first time we came here um, and they have sat with me and, and have heard from their son and I'll tell you a bit more about that towards the end but we sat as a group of eight on a regular basis and another gentleman whose name you'll hear on the tape named Jim Ellis who was Canadian and we received quite remarkable communications all of us and once we'd had survival evidence, we would ask questions of a philosophical nature and receive answers uh, on any subject that we cared to ask. And Mickey's voice would often change from this cockney voice to the deep, mature voice of a man that he claimed to be at that time. This is the real me. When you ask me a sensible question, he says... Um, then I can speak as I really am. And all the accent, Cockney accent faded away. However, what I'm going to literally hear is Cockney accent. Now, the tapes that I've got and from which I've extracted these voices are all my own personal uh, tapes. They are not what other people experienced or are selling around the country. They are seances at which I was present. I have not put any personal evidence on there because it would be of no interest to you. But what I've just tried to do is to convey to you the voices, the quality of the voices. Now, the first ones you'll hear uh, are not of the finest quality because in those days I didn't have a very good tape recorder. Um, and as tape recorders have improved, so the tapes improved. So I they picked them out from 1971 up until the early 80s when I when Leslie moved away from London, moved to Hove and I ceased to sit with him anymore. I felt it was other people had the, you know, the right to sit. And he was getting on. I feel that I saw him at his peak. 
and his mediumship did uh, start to deteriorate towards the end, which was inevitable, not because of anything on his part, simply because of age. And he told me at our recent meeting that he gave his last seance over two years ago, and he was so ill afterwards that he couldn't give another one. So uh, he has completely retired. Right, so the first voice you will hear is the voice of, or the alleged voice, of Ellen Terry, the Victorian actress. Um, it's quite clear. And I think the reason that actors and actresses maybe make very good communicators is because they are used to speaking in public. And I've found, as I've listened to the voices over the years, those who were of an extrovert nature <coughs> You usually manage to make very good communicators. If they were very timid or shy, the, the, the quality of the communication is quite poor sometimes. It's very difficult to hear. I'm very naughty in these sentences. I, when they used to say, can you hear me? I'd say, pardon? Can you speak up a bit to try to get the voice a bit louder for my tone recorder? <laughs> of course, what it does, as Mickey said, it explains, takes a lot more energy. But I thought, well, if I get a shorter one, better quality, I'd rather have a long one of poor quality. <laughs> you learn a lot of these things in this business. So, let's just listen to what she has to say. And actually, it is some time since last I spoke to you. Nonetheless, in a country, as it were, such as mine, where time exists not, and one is only conscious of time when one endeavors to make a contact or a link with your earth and by your thoughts are we conscious of time at all. Mm. It is extraordinarily difficult to hold fast to earth memories when we have been here as I have now for over 40 years it is extremely difficult to recapture with any clarity some memories some events of the past for all this seems to have been such a long time ago and one, of course, has become adjusted to one's new life, which is full of interest, full of happenings which even if one would wish to convey in words, I know it would be practically impossible because so much that transpires on this side of life cannot be picturized in words to you. Indeed, I feel each time I come more and more the difficulty in transmitting very much that would make sense to you, or perhaps would bear any great value to you. Everything must be brought down to a level of earthly comprehension. Mm. And so it is that I'm sure that others who can say much the same and refer to events and incidents similar to my own on a level which only can be described in a sense as a material conception of things spiritual. And I feel so much in a sense nonsense has been talked about the spirituality and spiritual conditions, possibly chiefly due to the numerous references and the countless years to biblical sayings and happenings and the aspect of mind of possibly the church, the clergy, was 
comprehension of things spiritual is in a sense at times, to say the least of it, very much misunderstood, very much carried by things which in themselves are far removed from reality, as we understand the term and expression of spiritual. Spiritual is not necessarily religious. And whenever I think back to earthly conception of things, spiritual is invariably tied up or affected by or colored by the interpretation given by the church. Spirituality is not necessarily what it may seem or what it may have been conveyed by people on earth. Spirituality in a sense is not necessarily, and in fact very rarely has anything to do with religion as such. Vicky, who, who is the main control, was um, a young boy of about 12, was a newspaper a seller, and he used to live in Camden Town, and he will refer, refers on the tape to Camden Town later on. His real name was John Whitehead, which he revealed at some stage uh, during his communications. I want you to do, I've got two versions of Vicky. One is where he's speaking quite seriously, he's being asked a question about the fourth dimension, what it is and so on. And later on in the tape, you will hear him in jocular mood. When he was, when he was um, funny, he could be very funny, very sharp. It was quite a battle keeping up with him. Yeah, I think the only time I, I ever stumped Mickey was when I asked him a question and, he, and he, I said, Mickey, do you know why the skeleton couldn't go to the dance? He said, I said, because he had no body to go with. And he started off. <laughs> but normally, very quick witted, um, as are all child guys. Everyone you care to know, whether it, it's Charlie who comes with Lincoln or Christopher through Stuart or Mickey or uh, as the same used to come through Mona. I really used to enjoy their, these guys because they were so quick witted. Very often their mediums are the opposite, <laughs> you know, which makes it even more evidential, doesn't it? <laughs> not saying you two are quick with this now. Right, let's listen to Vicky. Couldn't possibly comprehend. Yes, I. But they talk about the fourth dimension in particular. We, we live in three dimensions here. They appear to live in four. What is the fourth dimension? Could you just briefly, could you just say, is it time or something like that? You know, time is, in a sense, an aspect of space. Mm -hmm. But it's more than that. I don't know how to put this. Well, that's fine. It's uh, lively around. That's not as much as time. I don't know how to put this. Man, man is suspended in a kind of odd, strange way, and he's not encased, and he's not subject to the restrictions, as you understand, restrictions of time and space, and limitless. But I don't think that there's any way in which one can really put this in your words. I only know an aspect of it because obviously I haven't reached that different stage of evolution. You see, man must think of himself and can only think of himself, and indeed only wants to think of himself as himself, as he knows himself, and as he sees others around him about him. Man only wants to think of himself as an individual, as a person. 
as a kite. This is the minute part of the reality. It's human nature that you want to think of yourself, not as yourself. One of the people you know about, as you remember them when they left you from the material into the spiritual. But you've never really known anyone in a sense. You've only known an aspect of somebody. And this is where it becomes actually impossible to explain. Oh, that's very good, Nikki. Oh, no, seriously, I feel so helpless and hopeless because you think of me as you hear me, as you come to know me, and almost in a sense expect me to sound or be or... uh, But this is the minutest part of me. I'm not just what I seem, obviously. I'm restricted, if you like, or confined to some extent by the conditions that have developed prevalence, as you call it, under the circumstance of my contact with the limitation, if you like, placed upon me by the power and the resources of the instrument and the conditions that are created of times by the rest of the community of people who happen to be present. But what you're hearing and what you're getting is only a very small aspect of the reality of oneself. Oneself is not confined in shape or in form or in sound, as you might hear it in its limited aspect of sound. That's Mickey being very serious and talking about the fourth dimension. The later on you'll hear him when he's in humorous mood, (coughs) talking to one of the sitters uh, some years later. The next voice I want to play for you is um, a foreign voice. It is the alleged voice of Professor Charles Richet who is talking uh, about unidentified flying objects, flying saucers, or call it what you will. And Jim Ellis again um, asked the question. And this is the only um, tape recording we have, and I wish I'd asked a lot more questions now, (laughs) about flying saucers, because at that time I wasn't all that interested in it. But now I am. And where Richet talks extremely fast, if it is him course, we are uh, assuming, as Don would always say, assuming you're telling the truth. <laughs> ah. um, so you have to form your own judgment, but you may have difficulty hearing it. I can only apologise for the poor quality of the recording, uh, because it was taken over 20 years ago, but it gets better as we go along. So uh, if you like, we'll just listen to this for a few minutes. Uh, Professor Richet talking to a, a, communi- a sitter uh, who is from Worthing, the only one we have on, actually, on UFOs. There are kinds of things, there are many fears, many places, many conditions of life, and a group of man's imagination and realization. In the atmosphere there are many words of different vibrations of their names. And they have uh, instruments, they have methods of transport, uh, which are far beyond the comprehension. And of course, they have been making contact with us, and there will be other contacts made. But of course, that is all suspicious. Man's mind is suspicious. Always he thinks if someone wants to make contact, especially if it is from an outside source, which you don't understand, even if it is one nation to another, they are suspicious. They think it is bad. They think they are looking for certain things, which to make war or something. These people who come to you from out of space and find sources as you put them are souls of high intelligence, far removed from man's intelligence, and only come in quietly to the speed and peace of atmosphere, you know, they, but they are suspicious in as much they have reason to be a man. Man is still in many ways a child, still full of fear, but the souls that come to you from the various spheres of speed, and some will come to you in what you call this message of transport or time source, these are good souls. Highly evolved beings who have a great desire to be an assistance, because we know 
So before very long, when there's a miracle, if such a thing happens, uh, the world could finish in many ways as you know it, because man is so stupid and he thinks these things which could be such danger to human lives. We are concerned, that is why we are working side and day hard together as many groups, you might say, to bring a realization and truth to your world before it is too late, before man completes for himself uh, this terrible thing that he has so long been for some reason. Do you have this feeling that you have of uncertainty, this feeling of possibly this or terrible thing could happen any time? Man is made of terrible atmosphere condition for himself and we have to look to some things to try to prevent it. We try to use influence to influence people in high places in the world, which is very difficult, because their minds are set on material things. If only man would realize that the world is full, uh, it is but a little place in the world which you are learning lessons. But man is full of fear. That is man's great problem. And if you eradicate fear from himself, there is no hope for the future. Of course, when we have landed at different times, there's a possibility of the conveyances which you have seen, and sometimes I've been a photograph. These are so different to anything which you can imagine. You may get a visualization of shape that is true, but the speed by which they can travel is so tremendous that, uh, uh, frankly, it is amazing that you get a picture, but nevertheless, these sources, as you know, they are very real transports, real methods of transports. Can they make themselves invisible and visible? No, not in, not in the sense that you can wish to convey to me, otherwise you cannot photograph it. No, no, they are, when they enter into your eyes condition, they are very solid and very real and very photogenic, as you call it. And the people who inherit them, although they are different beings, uh, they are such a high vibration of life, and it is very difficult for them to enter into earth vibration without having some form of covering that protects them. This is in itself quite an artist's art, it is so impossible to explain to you. The same as if someone from your world to enter into another planet and to land on another planet, he would have to have certain protection. The same applies to the souls that come to you. But this is uh, something that is very real, but at the same time it's difficult to explain to you. But uh, when we come to you, it is different in this fashion, of course, but when they come on from their own spheres, which are not so far removed from us, or when you don't receive them or know them, they are not only just the planets, but there are other worlds, many worlds, mm -hmm. according to condition of vibration and the, the development of this race of peoples. The new man, the man is always thought to be the only being. But, uh, far beyond our comprehension, that they have landed, they have come here, that these are advanced beings, um, and so on, and many more will come in, in the years to come. Um, that their worlds are not far removed from us, but in the same way as we have to have protective clothing to land on other planets, so they <coughs> require uh, to come here, and they can make themselves uh, known and shown on photographs. He said, it is a, a miracle that you're able to get photographs at all, uh, but that's only because they uh, create this appearance of solidity. So, that, that was the one, and I now wish we had more. Now, whether it is Professor Richray, Ellen Terry, or anybody else, I have the faintest idea, I can't prove it to you. But as uh, many of you know, Professor Richray was very really interested in uh, did over 30 years' experimentation. It didn't mean he was convinced at the end of his life that, uh, as I said in an article, a reply to someone who um, wrote about this in, in our newsletter. It's very dangerous to quote people in one peculiar case when I could prove, quote something else and prove the opposite. <laughs> so I quote from the Bible. Professor Richet wasn't convinced of the spirit hypothesis. If it is him, then obviously he is now, <laughs> because he's there. And I believe that is the ultimate proof of survival, is death. 
that will convince you more than any message you're ever going to get from a medium. <laughs> Supposing one of them comes back after death and proves it and says it's not true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I think you'll probably do the same. I should come back and say there's nothing there. <laughs> Excuse me, can I just say something? Yes, of course. I'm a taper voluntary, not that, of course. No, no. And I played it to a, a, a lady from our church, and it was her great aunt, and she said, That's Aunt Ella. Really? We were witness to this, is what she said. And she couldn't believe it, and she listened to it through, and she said, That's definitely her voice. Well, that brings me to my next point, because Leslie Flint's one of the most tested mediums of all. In his book, uh, Voices in the Dark, you'll see photographs where he found gagged and filled <coughs> with coloured water, and yet the voices came. Even when he sat in a cabinet in public, uh, the microphones were placed about two feet outside the cabinet, uh, which would be impossible for a ventriloquist to use, because A, they require a dummy anyway, um, to project their voice. <laughs> <laughs> and yet the voice has spoken to the microphone. I always remember the one or two plays of Reading Church, but I, it was so amusing, because Mickey came through and he said, I've got a dead man here, and he wants to talk to a Mr. Dead Man. <laughs> <laughs> and the audience was Mr. Dead Man. He said, I've got a dead man here. And of course, it's just it's almost impossible to believe that there it was, you know, <laughs> dead man talking to a dead man. <laughs> Right, I'll deal with any questions at the end, but thank you for that comment. Now, the other thing was that um, voice prints, like fingerprints, can be very evidential. Everyone has a unique voice pattern. And in the experiments they did with Leslie Flint, uh, where there are recordings, say, of Ellen Terry and so on, the voice prints matched when they were checked. That's interesting. So, uh, and it wasn't the voice print of a dentist or something like they assumed with Margaret Graham, you know. It was the voice prints matched of the communicator. Now, the next lady, if I remember correctly, um, and she will give her name as you go along, but it is Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, many of you will know, um, had her own hospital, women's hospital, was the first woman doctor, or one of the first, anyway. She claims she was the first. Uh, not so sure. So, we'll let you hear her voice, and you can notice the difference between her and Ellen Terry, and in her voice, I, I particularly notice uh, Leslie Flint's, um, I would say, his voice seems to overlay it. It's just too loud for anyone, or can you all hear it all right? Oh, yes. okay. oh, fine. For a moment, if I may, just to come and speak to you, and I would particularly like to speak to Mrs. Rick Milner. Mm -hmm. Right, now before we go any further, I must just tell you about Mrs. Rick Milner, uh, who I've known for many years. Her husband uh, was a police surgeon, and uh, we were friends quite a long time. She lost her little daughter, Samantha, in a car accident. Um, at the age, I think, of about six or seven. And she was driving the car at the time, and she has no memory of the accident at all. Completely blotted out from her mind. But she had a great sense of guilt. She felt very guilty over it. And as she told me on one occasion, she had driven all over the world accident-free. And she came to London, she had driven to Japan, all over the place, and uh, she had this accident. And she was absolutely devastated. Well, um, I mean, I've never lost a child. Anyone who has uh, lost a child will know the sort of feeling that it is. One can only imagine, you know, what it must be like. It must be, I think, pretty awful. Her husband, um, I was going to bring him up here to one of Gordon Higginson's seances, materialisation. I'd invited him up to come up. Unfortunately, they were, they were delayed and I unable to get here in time. And it was one of these seances where Gordon had agreed to be filmed uh, by a German film crew who claimed they could film by the light of a candle. And unfortunately, because of the light, he was severely burnt in the solar plexus. And as he came out of the library, 
So Dr. Rick Milner arrived at the front door. <coughs> Amazing coincidence. And uh, examined him and was able to treat him immediately for a third degree burn. That's how bad it was. And it was in a circular shape. He'd been wearing his belt and the metal of the belt had imprinted itself. I said, I saw it. I was there. And he, he treated him there and then. So we had such an interesting conversation because he gave me a lift back to, um, to Tilbury where I was going to catch the ferry I lived in Gravesend. And we had such a conversation. Um, I was in the back seat leaning over talking to Angela and uh, her husband that all of a sudden there was these flashing lights and the police car pulled up alongside and pulled over. And I was desperate to catch the last ferry. Switch your engine off, sir. Get out the car. Oh, no. Do you realise that you've been veering all over the road? And, uh, oh, Mr. Rick Milner. <laughs> it's a police surgeon. <laughs> they they realised, uh, have you been drinking? And I thought, well, he certainly hasn't been doing that. It's that idea for a start. But, you know, obviously I hadn't even noticed. But because we'd been engaged in conversation, you could just see the car <laughs> The police had been following him. Anyway, as soon as they realised he hadn't been drinking and whatever sent him on his way. We didn't tell him he was going to be for sales. <laughs> I've just caught the ferry with about seconds to spare. That's just by the way. Now, um, you will hear Elizabeth Garrett Anderson talking to Mrs. Rick Milner. And later on, I'm going to let you hear the voice of her daughter who comes to her. First of all, this is, that's the connection. Can you hear? I can hear you. You do not know me. But I am sure you will not mind my speaking to you just for a moment or two. Because I know of your great loss, physical loss, and the child. She is here, of course. And I want you to try, if you can, to realize how very, very happy she is. And I know there are times when you are very despondent, very depressed. Particularly the circumstances of the child's past. You must not hold this too much to yourself. Try to realize that it was unfortunate and unavoidable. You might not even think that, but it is, I think, true to say that it was unavoidable. The child is extremely well, extremely happy, constantly around and about you in the home. And she just above all else wants you to be happy. She does not like to see you sad. No. It comes back to <coughs> I think if she can be bright and cheerful and happy, and I think you have vastly improved, of course, it makes her feel much happier. I do try. You have two other children. I have, yes. I do have, yes. Do you know who is Paul? Paul is my one of my sons. Oh, well... I don't know. I only know that your little girl, she thinks the little boy sees her. Oh. Have you any idea of this? I, I, I'm not sure if he does or not. I, I, he could see her. I don't, I don't know. I would ask. <coughs> well, I wouldn't ask if I were you. I think I would wait until it comes spontaneously yeah. from the child, would you? Um, even though your little girl is with you a great deal in the evenings, yes. are you ever conscious of her presence? I am, yes. Of course, I believe you are yourself, from what I've been told, gradually developing. I'm trying. Needs a great deal of patience. The whole tragedy, of course, I think, of the spiritualistic movement as such, is that there is not enough dedication and patience in these things. It does require great patience. I find coming here very stimulating. I've been here on many occasions. And the new ourselves, some known, many unknown, gather around. Some need help too. Some are us And sometimes you can help them more than we can. I never cease to wonder at the remarkable manifestation of the power that is generated at times, particularly. There's a wonderful thing. There's Leslie coughing. I'm particularly interested in 
usually Mrs. Milne. You know, your husband, if you have not, may well have heard about me. Why should he? My name is Gary Danielson. I thought you were before. I haven't been this way. I too was in the profession. You know I was the first woman doctor. And you know that they're talking about pulling my hospital down. Well, I've heard rumors to that effect. I do hope they do not do that. But I do appreciate very much indeed the opportunities that we do have from time to time in coming to communicate. Some, of course, find great difficulty. Others do quite well. But it's not easy. It's so easy for you on your side, and I appreciate your position, but to be over anxious and perhaps a little too demanding, who knows, but I understand it's human and natural if you've lost someone there and there, that you might make a contact. And, but I don't think you ever can realize sometimes the difficulties that they have to contend with, and especially if the person perhaps is rather shy and rather averse to speaking in front of strangers. This is why perhaps for some people it is much better to have a personal, private communication. I think often people who attend these groups, their loved ones, are rather reluctant to speak in front of strangers. I think sometimes it puzzles them too as to why they should be present. But one must be grateful indeed we are given the opportunity of conversing and contacting, being of service, being of help. I find this absolutely fascinating. There are so many people gathered around here, all types, all nationalities, not that there's any nationalities here, but obviously when on earth they were different nationals, all gathered here together. I remember you, Mr. George, uh, what is your name? Um. Grandly, I knew it was to do with sorts. <laughs> I remember that no, no, self, yes. Colonizing, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. Yes, don't you know? Uh, when was it years ago now? Uh, when you could you have train your memory, you colonize, yes. you uh, I mean cranberry and cranberry and, and so on. You mustn't think I'm being rude, I'm not being personal like right that. It's just that um, I knew your name was something like cranberry and cranberry. I didn't think exactly. How are you? How are you? like talking on the telephone, and which I thought it was. It's a bit of a dial-up spirit world, and through they come. And he said, that's what you think, my boy. He said, I come here with all sorts of thoughts uh, in my mind, ready to speak to you. And then I'm told to put my face into this mask-like thing, which is vibrating and fluctuating all the time. And as I do so, he said, my mind goes blank. And if you say, who are you, what's your name, where you come from, what you do here, where do you live, how old are you, uh, that sort of thing, you get nothing. But as you encourage them and, and uh, start talking, so the voice becomes stronger, stronger, and before you know where you are, you're having a, a, a two worlds conversation. On one occasion I remember we were in the middle of a communication when the voice suddenly stopped nothing. And Leslie Flynn gets very agitated when nothing's happening for more than a few minutes. 
and in, in this very plaintive voice he has this Mickey Mickey are you there Mickey Mickey you know you think oh Christ. shut up really say well I do you know, I feel the spirit will know what's going on and sometimes Mickey used to come through and say shut up you're doing our best you know <laughs> or do you mind not sneezing all over your clients if you had a cold or something like that you <laughs> start sneezing in the middle of the message and um, on this particular occasion the voice just stopped I was going to say dead but I mean <laughs> it stopped in the middle of the, of the sentence and half an hour we sat there in absolute silence when we came out Bram who was outside said, uh, oh, he said, we've just had the most dreadful electrical storm. We never had a thing in there, of course. I said, when was that? He said, about half an hour ago. And at the moment the storm broke, <coughs> all communications ceased. Now, so it just shows you, uh, it was obviously that was linked, because weather conditions do make a difference. That there's far more to communication than we realise, which is what they were emphasising in the beginning. I think the next one is Mickey. I can't remember. Now, this would be in, in Jocelyn Mood. Talking about. Yes, Mickey, I don't like walls. Oh, I can't bear them. Oh, they're lovely. Well, you look like Teddy Lee. Let's give God a fair one. Well, you can tell that, Drew. Well, that's worse. Oh, no, it's not. Well, you can tell that, Drew. Well, that's worse. Oh, no, it's not. It's nice. It's lovely, Drew. Well, I mean, I'm all from, and, you know, loving everything, but well, they, they give me the creeps. Oh, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. I know they shouldn't. I know because I'm over here, but I've never seen any of them here. Yeah, but you... No. Oh, Mickey, I'm not coming here, aren't you? Well, I hope when you come, you'll leave the tongue behind. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, uh, what, what's about the what, what do you find fascinating about it, then? Well, I find very interesting creatures, Mickey, because they're sort of like the Mickey of surviving ancestors of what we were. You know, they're... What? You know, they were sort of... Well, I must admit, I did have an uncle who looked like that. But that was because he used to stuff himself with beer. And he got a the barrel, and his eyes popped out, you know. Because my mother would go and they all stuck in the pub and occasionally he lived in a different district where uh, uh, uncle would come and spend a weekend and they used to go in the pub on a Saturday night, you know. And I always struck me as if he looked like a big fat toad, you know. <laughs> I used to call him Toady. His real name was Edward Ted, but I always called him Toady on the choir. Good times I stood outside that place, you know, when they were boozing on a Friday or a Saturday night. I used to get an arrow with a bit of luck and a bottle of pop. You know, my mother was singing away, told her her voice. I always knew how tight she was and how she sang. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know Cam in town, do you? No, not very well. Not by the old You know the old mother and cat? No, I didn't. My mum and dad used to keep that place going. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mum used to talk over the old wall and the woman next door, you know. And they always have to say, oh, she says, uh, I must be going up. You know, this one do. She says, I've got things to do. It's only because she knows the bloody pub was opening. <laughs> if she says, I'm going to get on, you know. <coughs> my mum was a pot of one for drink. Okay. Anyway, I don't know why I'm telling you my life history. Well, you're telling about that, Anyway, fancy keeping tones. Should be interesting. Well, I've already told me all, but... <laughs> 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 I don't approve of her being changed, but it's for her own safety. Because the cat can chase her, you see. Not to Where did you get it from in the first place, then? Oh, this one. Yeah. Well, my neighbour found it in his garden, and he was afraid that because they had two cats and all the others coming in, that they would chase it. And, uh, well, to cat, a long story short, I sort of acquired it. Because but aren't you sort of, you don't have a bother about the place, do you? Well, no, but because of the cat, I have to keep her in a tank. She's hibernating now, you see, it's the winter. But in the summer, she's got a little pen in the garden. Well, I did think that you were a bit odd, but now I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in the nicest possible way. But just the all, I think it's marvellous, really, because I could never take her a toad. Well, I mean, I could take them, I think. You would rather like them. Yeah, probably you're right. 
Also, I don't see how I can live in any and developing is to learn from little people who can't stand the sidewalk. I think this is the test, you know, of your friendship and love is to learn to like people that normally you wouldn't. I mean, it's easy to live with someone and make a go or something where everything's laid on and you've got everything in common and all the rest of it. The art of living and developing and inspiring is, you know, is to learn to love all humanity irrespective of who they are. It's the easiest thing to love people, of course, you've got many qualities about, you know, that you're drawn to and all that. Now, I think that, I suppose, that learning to live with a toad is good education. <laughs> What's the question? Uh, you know, we have the changing of seasons here. Yeah. Well, the changing of the Yeah. What is this? This is me asking a question about um, <coughs> seasons in the spirit world. Do they have seasons? Do you have the changing of seasons in a way? Well, you see, this is another aspect. I mean, the point is, you ask a pointed question, I'm just giving you a correct answer as best I know. But you see, people in your world, I suppose it's natural. Uh, when they do begin to deep into, go into this, they get ideas about it, you know. But the point is, you'll hear about different conditions of life, or you'll hear about the third sphere, or the summer air, as some people refer to it. But really, there are thousands and thousands upon thousands of states of being. And a great deal depends on the individual as to what they receive, or what they inhabit, or what they are aware of. It's a state of mind. All life is a state of mind. And on some spheres, on certain spheres, the particular spheres near the earth, then the conditions in which people exist are very similar to the earth in many respects. And they will have changes as you turn it in atmosphere or season. I'm not suggesting they create it exactly by a thought process, but it is true to say that atmospheric uh, conditions applying to individuals are according to their state of being. And, and often things are deliberately allowed or made possible so that that person can temporarily find a state of happiness which would be natural and right for them. But everything is a continual evolution. And as you progress and open up your consciousness and your mind to other aspects of things, certain things which once seemed important will gradually disappear, and other things much more important and much more vital and much more necessary to your evolution uh, become more apparent. In other words, you can be going through stages of evolution and entering into, partially entering into a new state of mind or state of experience. But it doesn't necessarily mean to say that you've necessarily reached a certain pitch or goal. In fact, all life is constant change. That's what makes um, the reality of life after death, because there's no such thing as a beginning or an end. In other words, um, some people say when I'm a, well, I don't understand this, you know, uh, this business of going on forever and ever eternity, it boggles the imagination, of course it does. Nobody can appreciate or understand what eternity is all about. Actually, life is only possible when it's constant change. What is life fundamentally but vibration anyway? We're in a state of vibration higher than yours, that's why you don't see us. But we have to lower our vibration to come deeper into yours and tune in and mix with you and make possible communication. But all these aspects of being are conditions and states of mind. And of course for certain people, certain things are necessarily essential on a temporary basis until they change themselves. We do have seasons, but they're not in a sense quite the same as you would say seasons. Uh, we do have spring and we have summer. Uh, I wouldn't say we have winter as you understand it, but there are conditions of near of the earth where they are affected by vibrations appertaining to the material. You see, everything is a reflection. I don't think you'll ever grasp this, and we can't explain it to you either. But really, in a sense, all life is a reflection of, 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 of another aspect, or an aspect... I mean, you are really reproducing over and over again things that happened centuries ago. Not in exactly the same sense, but man is reproducing himself. Man is reproducing over and over again all sorts of man and kind of things who are in existence and have been forgotten. I, I, I don't know how to go into being or expression about this, but the sense. voice changed. Um, I think I've stopped at the right place there. But you notice um, um, how he changed from this very jocular move one minute 
immediately asks a serious question how he changes and, and answers it. We never had any hesitation ever in answering questions. Quite amazing. Um, in the home circle itself, at least his home circle, which met every week, he was told that un under no circumstances must he ever give up the home circle, which was the, the um, sixth group. Well, Leslie, being Leslie, of course, did fell out with somebody or somebody fell out with somebody else. And in my view, his mediumship was never the same after that broke up, <coughs> because it is in the home circle that the development of the medium takes place, not in public and not in this work. Now, um, I think the next voice I want to play to you is the voice of Samantha, this little girl, who comes through. And uh, you can hear her talking to her mother. And I'll comment about that afterwards. Keys. 
And what's the change in her as she changed through receiving evidence of her child's survival? And I can remember in South Africa one of the most fascinating stories about Mona van der Waal. A woman came to her from the Belgian Congo <coughs> whose child had been taken by the father to uh, America. She was devastated. And she came to Cape Town and she used to have sittings with uh, van der Waal I think about four years. And you know, I used to look at this woman, and in her eyes was tragedy written in her large sadness, uh, unhappiness. And I always met a guy saying, You must be patient. One day uh, your child will come to you. The time has got to be right. Your child will come back to you. Have no fear. And that kept this woman going. She was almost suicidal couldn't find any trace of it. One day the guide, his name is Zara, said, the time has come, he said, for your child to be returned to you. You must write to the wife of the President of the United States, who at that time was uh, President Kennedy's wife, Jackie Kennedy. And she will help you. And she did. And told the story of what had happened. <coughs> Jackie Kennedy got the FBI involved, they traced this man, um, the guy told her to go to America to fight in the courts, and she came back with their child. I found such a good story. <laughs> it's clear. She brought her child to the church, and we saw, ladies and gentlemen, the transformation of that woman and her eyes. I shall never forget it to my dying day. She never became a spiritual. Ever. She was just the woman she was, but her life was transformed through mediumship. And I think that's what it's all about. Don't you? Yes. <laughs>
He will be available, um, and he'll tell you where, we'll arrange a room for him. After nine o'clock, when everything's finished, and what have we done? Anybody would like to listen to it? They'll find it interesting. And Mr. Breakspear over here, Frank, he has got tapes as well, I know, which he, he wrote and told me about, of various people's experiences uh, on the other side, uh, woods and green tape, tapes, um, about people, what they found when they passed over. So, if anybody wants to listen to any more um, during the evenings, Ahead, and please see Liz or all Frank and help you. Lounge is usually free after nine o'clock. Lounge is usually free, I'm told, after nine o'clock. So, you know, it is worth listening to. You can learn a great deal from other people's experiences. I'm only sorry that today it's not quite the same, but there are two brilliant mediums here in this library. I'm very fortunate to have in this society. And you heard last night the very moving communications that came through Stuart. And we've had similar ones through uh, Lincoln. And that's what we look forward to as, as time goes on. More and more of you will develop these gifts. It, the burden won't rest on just one or two people. But all of you will develop it yourselves in your own homes. And get your own evidence. No one will ever take that away from you. Thank you,